Hello everyone and welcome to Tech Talk session number 24. Today's topic is partial discharge testing of metal closed capacitor banks and harmonic filter banks. Uh, so this is an important topic. We have talked about um, uh, SFRA testing a few weeks ago in a Tech Talk and that was a test that we conducted at the factory uh, during factory acceptance testing to determine the um, filter characteristics and to confirm the operation or characteristics of the filter to make sure we got that in fact impedance waveform or um, impedance profile for that filter that we would hope for. We also did a tech talk on impulse testing, another important factory test. And impulse testing helps to also confirm uh, the impulse rating of the equipment that you got what you asked for. Uh, Historically, uh, as I talked about in that presentation, it's, it's uh, the impulse rating of the components and the clearances in the withstand test were the three tests that many companies, in fact, even today, I think most companies, use only those three tests to verify uh, that the equipment is um, designed for the impulse rating. Uh, so uh, we take it one step further. We actually do the impulse uh, test here. and We confirm uh, that the equipment, in fact, does uh, meet the impulse rating. So today we're talking about partial discharge testing. It's a third very important um, factory acceptance test that we do here at NEPSI. And uh, partial discharge is very important because it speaks to the life of the equipment uh, rather than just the design of the equipment. So we can pass impulse, we can pass the withstand test, uh, we can pass the SFRA test, uh, but uh, what, when we were talking about how long the equipment will last, Really, partial discharge testing uh, is, is the key test for that. And uh, again, uh, those other tests do not always reveal uh, the defects that can, that can be revealed by the partial discharge test. So we're going to get on with the presentation. And um, you can see here partial discharge testing. And um, it's the presentation. Let me see here. Okay. Oh, I've got to do. I'm getting more computer savvy as we go. Don't forget about the um, PDH contact hours. Uh, just email myself or Matt afterwards and uh, we will get you the PDH contact hours for the presentation. You can use these uh, towards your CE credits and those areas that do qualify uh, for, for the use of those, that time. Uh, remember what NEPSI does. NEPSI is a manufacturer of medium voltage metal closed capacitor banks, harmonic filter banks. Uh, these presentations are about uh, educating our customer base as to what NEPSI does and how we test. And it's, uh, uh, they're, they're offered to you to help you specify the equipment and to understand what goes into a properly designed, manufactured, specified, uh, applied type of device. And that's what we are here doing in these tech talks. Um, if you uh, could hit that like button down below and also subscribe and as we, uh, as we plan future tech talks, you will be notified on your YouTube, um, whatever you would call it, YouTube URL. So we're, we're, um, today we're talking about uh, partial discharge and what is partial discharge. So the first thing is partial discharge um, is, a, is, a, is a discharge within the insulation or on a surface of insulation. Um, that uh, occurs, it's like a um, micro short circuit you can almost think about, but it's a discharge within uh, a short uh, distance uh, within, within insulation or along the surface that doesn't actually bridge the gap. And uh, a lot of times you hear this uh, when you're underneath a power line, you hear uh, a little snapping and cracking and popping and that's partial discharge and sometimes we might call that corona. Um, it can also occur inside the insulation if you have um, uh, uh, say a, a bushing and there's a void within the bushing, uh, you can have partial discharge within that, that void. Um, so, uh, but, but it doesn't result in a flashover. Oftentimes when we are doing uh, high pot testing, withstand testing, we're bringing say a 34.5 kV piece of equipment, we'll bring it up to 80 kV, we'll hear a lot of, a lot of partial discharge going on. It will be making a lot of sound uh, when you see cable testing the same thing. Uh, that's partial discharge is what you're hearing. Uh, you don't actually get the flashover. You will get the, the lightning strike that you saw last week on the uh, impulse test. Um, partial discharge is, is um, enough discharge to cause damage to the insulation and it's quite repetitive, uh, but it doesn't result in flashover. But it causes damage to the insulation. That's really the key here. Um, if uh, we were to continue to increase that voltage, the partial discharge would become so great that you would end up with a flashover. And that's uh, what happens during withstand tests if, 
if you do not have the, the property design. Um, so um, <clears throat> oftentimes you hear the terms corona, treeing, tracking. These all are all a result of partial discharge. You can also go to uh, C37.301-2009, uh, the IEEE standard, and learn more about partial discharge testing there and also some introduction information. And further down the presentation, uh, we, we list some other standards and a couple of videos uh, on YouTube that I would suggest that you, that you watch if you're looking to learn more about this topic. Um, so what's the impact of, of partial discharge? What is damage? And you can do a search on the internet, and that's all I did here. I went and grabbed a bunch of figures. Um, unfortunately, we even ourselves have pictures of our own equipment where uh, we've, we've been sent uh, by our customer base um, damage associated with partial discharge. But if I were to just kind of look at the left here, you can see that there's damage here and really a high voltage here. The white would be from corona on the outside and the, the black, I believe, would be more of an effect of, of tracking, carbon tracking, where you're, you've got damage to the installation and it's tracking to the, uh, to the wall here. Uh, so th this is, you have a high voltage area, you have a pass through, it's very common that that's where a partial discharge will occur. The other, th here we have cable, you can see the white on the outside and this is a very common um, practice that people have. You know, you can buy 15 kV jumper cable and 15 kV jumper cable is not grounded. It doesn't have ground shield on it. And therefore the, the, uh, the voltage stress profile within the cable is not, uh, is not evenly distributed around the cable. And as a result, when you take that cable and you rest it at ground potential, you have localized stresses and therefore you have partial discharge and it results in damage of the cable. And over time, it, it will eventually fail. So one thing to remember is whenever you see uh, medium voltage jumper cable, it's never to be applied at ground potential. You're to post it off insulators to make sure um, that uh, it doesn't have the, 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 uh, the electric field, the, the, uh, the stress at the point where the cables are touching the ground. Um, another common place you see uh, issues of partial discharges, pass-throughs here. You can kind of see the, the carbon buildup along the cable here. And what's going on is the partial discharge is eating away at the insulation. And I, I kind of got that Pac-Man there to kind of think about it. It's, you know, it's eating away at the insulation. Um, it doesn't fail the equipment right away. It takes a lot of time for partial discharge to, to fail the equipment. But eventually it will fail the equipment. And it's, it's a design defect to have partial discharge within your equipment. So if you're looking to guarantee 20 year life, uh, you have to have partial discharge free equipment. And that really comes down to the design. Metal closed cap banks and filter banks are all custom designed. And, uh, and at, because of that, you want to test each and every design. So you type tests. And uh, we would also recommend that you consider making a production test. In other words, each and every design is, is uh, tested. So uh, it's that repetitive uh, partial discharge that occurs each and every cycle that in time will fail the equipment. And what happens is you get this type of activity going on as shown in these pictures. Um, so um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the things to, to realize about partial discharge is, is that oftentimes uh, the, the system will degrade over time. The insulation will crack uh, and it will, it will become worse and worse. But it's the switching operation, that final voltage stress, the final voltage transient, oftentimes that would result in an actual flashover. And that's what we see here. And it's an arc flash hazard situation. So um, NEPSI recommends that you uh, look to do dis partial discharge testing and design your equipment to be partial discharge free. And that's really what this, uh, this tech talk is about today. So where does uh, partial discharge occur? Um, it, it can occur in a lot of different places, but generally it's occurring phase to phase and it's also occurring phase to ground. We have a significant amount of voltage stress within the equipment. Um, it can occur within the solid dielectrics. Um, if you got, say, a sharp objects within a solid dielectric, so you have a transformer and it's a cast type transformer, sharp points within the, the actual insulation itself could result in partial discharge at those points. You could also have voids within that uh, insulation, say with a bushing, uh, an epoxy bushing that passes through a roof, a roof bushing. Uh, if during the manufacturing process there was an air bubble left inside 
um, that bushing, you would have partial discharge across the air bubble within that bushing. And eventually that bushing could fail. And uh, this is the point. You would not see that uh, because it's inside the bushing. You would not see a glow or a corona. Um, it would only show up on a test that you have this issue going on. A, a, a bushing that was manufactured that has an internal defect. It might be a proper design, but it's an internal defect. Uh, so we commonly see this with uh, the jumper cables, roof bushings, through all bushings are key places where you might get partial discharge. You can also get it across the surface of an insulator. And if you've ever done maintenance of a medium voltage piece of equipment, the uh, insulator sometimes will become discolored, especially at the ends where uh, maybe you have an insulator and you have an end. Uh, the sharp edges at the end can cause a lot of, on the edge of the insulator, a lot of uh, corona and tracking on that. And over time, you get carbon buildup and it can flash over at that location. You also get at terminations or in transitions of bus work where you're going from one bus structure to a different bus structure. Floating metal parts up in the high voltage region that are not properly secured to, um, to the high voltage component uh, will and can result in partial discharge. And in time, it will fail the insulation up in that region. Uh, and then also within the dielectric fluids itself, if you have floating uh, metallic parts and things like that. When, um, when you look at the metal closed system, and that's what we are, we're metal closed capacitor bank harmonic filter bank manufacturers, so I can talk about, well, where would we have it in our equipment? Um, if it's a high pass harmonic filter like we show here, we definitely would have it up in this region here. Uh, where we have high voltage conductors passing up through uh, through the roof. Um, we use a, a medium voltage bushing here uh, that is composed of both a high voltage shield and a low voltage shield, so it's a true bushing. Um, so theoretically, there should be no partial discharge there. But if there's a defect within the bushing itself, you would have partial discharge within that air bubble that, that might be inside that bushing. So this partial discharge testing is important to detect uh, defects in the manufacturing process that might occur. Uh, you can get it along the, all the insulators within the equipment. So uh, across all your equipment, you have insulators, you're gonna get tracking along the outside that will show up as partial discharge. We also have, you know, our systems are multi-compartments. We, it's a compartmental design. And we do that because we're looking to, to segregate compartments uh, for isolation for the purpose of sometimes for safety uh, getting in and out, but also sometimes for thermal reasons to isolate the hot components from the cold components. Um, so where we're passing from one compartment to the other, uh, this would be a location. We have pass-throughs, kind of like that picture I showed you earlier. It's important that those pass-throughs get done correctly. If they're not done correctly, you'll get partial discharge at those locations. Uh, and so it's very common that people are passing um, medium voltage jumper cable through through those locations and if it's not done properly you'll have partial discharge there also. Um, <clears throat> down here at the reactors um, we we want to make sure that the reactor itself is properly grounded. Um, where else? At the terminations and really this doesn't impact us but terminations are a very common place where you get partial discharge once it's installed in the equipment. And then we, we kind of show this last one, which is where the bus bars come into the disconnect switch. We have a terminating bus bar joint there, and oftentimes we might get off the end of that bus bar partial discharge. Uh, so just some locations to think about and look at. Uh, so why perform a uh, partial discharge test in the joint factory acceptance test? I think I've already m mentioned it, but let's do it again. Uh, metal closed capacitor banks are custom. And um, so you want to confirm that the design is correct, but you also want to confirm that the manufacturing process is correct. You know, we're, we're sending equipment out to the shop. We have 20 or 30 um, or 40, I'm not sure how many people we have, but we have a bunch of people that are assembling um, these systems according to drawings. Did they do it correct? And uh, a partial discharge test would help to pick up on that, uh, on, on, on that design if there is a defect or not. Did they lay the for instance, that jumper cable onto the ground when it was supposed to be put on an insulator? Or did they bring two uh, medium voltage jumper cables together uh, that are of opposite phase and they shouldn't have done that? These are things that we can pick up on. So it's important to do uh, not only to confirm the design, but also confirm the manufacturing process. And uh, 
You also want to confirm that there's no defects in the components, the bushings uh, and, and so forth. Uh, all those all those medium voltage devices that rely upon solid insulation uh, for, for their impulse rating. So if you want to have 20 year life, make sure you specify partial discharge testing in your equipment. Um, so we're going to just talk about a couple of terms that you often see and all I do is take snippets from the standards. One is called a partial discharge inception voltage, and this is where corona occurs. When we're doing an impulse test, all right, question. Yeah, Paul, you got a question from Garrett in the chat. He asks if you can comment on the stress cone or the stress grading systems used on our cable terminations. Yes, I can. Well, so I only have a little bit of knowledge in this area, but uh, you're talking about like a Raychem insulation or 3M insulation termina termination, what happens at the medium voltage, and maybe I'll just tab, tab back real quick and go back to that medium voltage termination. Okay, so we're talking about these devices here, uh, their terminations. Um, when you, and I think you can see my mouse pointer, so you got high voltage here, and uh, you strip the ground shield off the cable, I think back to about this point here. And um, so this, this uh, insulation around a cable um, is, um, and it's not insulation, but it's a sleeve that goes around the, the outside of the cable. It's designed to grade the electric field, okay? Um, when, you look at a, when you look at a termination, they take and they strip the shield wire um, from from the um, surface of the conductor all the way back down below those sheds. And uh, without having a proper uh, sleeve around there to grade the, to grade the electric field, you would get an, an increased amount of stress down by that, down by that ring where, where the cable shield actually is. So the cable shield is uh, down below where it goes into the, say the underground or it goes into the conduit. That cable shield helps to keep the the electric field linear throughout, uh, and uh, so you don't have any uh, major stresses within the cable. But once you get to the end, uh, you have a disruption in the electric field, and uh, that termination uh, is is what grades the uh, electric field around it. I would suggest that maybe go to a, a Raychem uh, Raychem termination manual, and I'm sure it's explained it there how it's done, and they actually have some pretty good pictures on how it grades that electric field. Um, Incidentally, we do not use mini voltage terminations within our equipment. Uh, we stay away from that. There's a good amount of time that goes into, into putting those terminations on the cables. Uh, so we manufacture our equipment without those types of terminations. But the customer, when he comes into our equipment, he's using terminations. He has to, according to the electric codes. Uh, so we have the inception voltage. That's where Corona begins. It's, uh, it's where you have this partial discharge. Uh, occurring. Uh, so as you do your high pot testing, you start to raise your voltage, you'll get to a point where partial discharge will start to occur. And uh, you can see this on the meter when we go out back, and that's called the inception voltage. That's where corona begins, um, or partial discharge begins. And I keep using the word corona, but technically I should be using the word partial discharge. You get the extinction voltage. So think about this. We bring um, the system voltage up as you bring it up in voltage at some point you're going to start getting partial discharge and we will continue to raise at that point to some value and then after the um, a certain amount of time we will bring the voltage down when we bring the voltage down at some point the partial discharge will cease to exist it will drop down below and what we're looking for on our side is 100 picocoulombs and when it gets down below 100 picocoulombs uh, we would call that the extinction voltage and one of the things about inception and extinction voltage is oftentimes the extinction voltage is below the inception voltage. And really when you're doing testing is you want to make sure that your extinction voltage is above your normal over voltage of your system. So say I have a 34.5 kV, I would certainly want to make sure that my extinction voltage is at 38 kV or above because what can happen is and this is really the, one of the reasons you do this test, is if I have an overvoltage in the system, uh, that overvoltage could theoretically bring me up into the inception voltage region, and I could start to have partial discharge in my equipment. Uh, and then say the, this overvoltage condition goes away three seconds later. Say we had a, a load rejection issue. Uh, we, we dropped a bunch of load. 
Uh, you might get a 15 or 18 percent over voltage because you have 40 megabars capacitors on, and we just dropped a, a whole uh, a whole grinding mill. And that over voltage could bring you into into a situation where your, your partial discharge, your, you, you reached your inception voltage. The the uh, <clears throat> At that point, the system would drop down, but if, if the system voltage dropped back down to 34.5 kV and I didn't drop below my extinction voltage, corona would then persist forever. Uh, and that's really what you're trying to make sure is that if I do go into uh, partial discharge because of an over voltage, over voltage condition, that when my voltage drops back down, that I drop below that extinction voltage. And that's what this testing is about. And then we got this uh, term partial discharge test voltage, and that's really the test voltage or the passing voltage by which this extinction should occur. And that's the values that are written in the tables that I will show in a moment. Um, so I just do a couple of standards, uh, IEEE C37.20.3, 2013. Remember metal closed cap banks and filter banks, there, there's really no standard that, that, um, that dictates these designs. NEPSI uses this uh, standard C37.20.3. It's a switchgear standard load interrupter switchgear standard uh, to come up with our test values. And uh, so um, <clears throat> basically we're increasing our voltage to the, to the coronal level and then we're gonna be dropping it back down to the extinction level, which is defined by 1.1 times the, basically the rated voltage of the equipment divided by square root of three. So obviously here we're talking about line to neutral voltage with a 10% over voltage there. Uh, so once we come back down, we have to make sure if it was 38 kV gear, that at 24.1 kV, uh, we would be below 100 picocoulombs at 24.1 kV. And that's really what the test is involved with. So if I were to go, there's another standard that we often have to go to, CSA standard 22.2, uh, number 31-10. And it's very similar. We got a different table, slightly different set of values, a slightly different uh, procedure. But overall, we're basically bringing the voltage up, going into corona, going to partial discharge, then we're dropping our voltage down, and we're making sure that our partial discharge level at the extinction voltage, um, or the partial discharge voltage as the standard says, um, that, that our picocoulombs, the, the actual partial discharge value is below uh, that value. I think that's clear. So a typical test setup, and again, this is from IEC 60270, and incidentally, the IEEE standard follows, uh, follows this standard. Um, so we essentially have, um, <clears throat> we, we have this value Z here, uh, which is a filter. So we, we take our high voltage test set, we put a filter on it, and that filter is, is basically giving us a clean voltage supply. Uh, we have a um, high volt, so the high voltage supply incidentally is AC, it's an AC high voltage supply. CA is the test object, this, this would represent our harmonic filter, our capacitor bank, and uh, we remove the capacitors during the test. The capacitance is very significant otherwise and we would not be able to test the equipment. CK represents, uh, here it represents the, the voltage divider and also the, the coupling capacitor. That's all kind of built into our system. And then you got CD, the coupling device, which you're going to kind of see at the bottom of our, of our coupling capacitor. And uh, we run a cable over to this, this device called MI, which is a measurement instrument. And uh, <clears throat> so this is a system that we, we, we had purchased from uh, Hayfley Trench. Uh, not Hayfley Trench, but Hayfley. Um, <clears throat> and it's based upon 60270, and it's a test procedure and uh, method for evaluating partial discharge. And these are basically all the elements of this test equipment. And you're gonna see it in just a minute live for yourself. So I think we're about there. We are about there. So I'm gonna take off, go to the, um, go back to the factory floor. We got a piece of equipment out there. Pete and Jessica is there with, uh, with the test equipment.
Victor, are you all set? Yes, I am. All right, so this is the partial discharge um, setup, the test equipment. Uh, so we'll just talk about this piece of equipment first. It's 38 kV, 50 hertz, I think it's 20, 20 megabar, something like that. Yes. It's a three-stage bank. Uh, this is the control panel. So when we do partial just discharge testing, we put the stages in the open position. No, closed. closed position, I'm sorry. In the closed position, and um, everything's in the circuit except for the capacitors. We cannot test what the capacitor is in. It's just too much capacitance. Uh, so this is the way we set up the equipment. We take the lightning arresters out. What, PTs. What, PTs. PTs are out. out. And uh, everything else is in. So we, again, we uh, will ground two phases and keep one phase in. We do the test three times. So let me go through the test equipment before we get on with the uh, procedure. We have Jessica here again and Pete here again uh, to do the test. Obviously, we, we do this right in our plant environment as we did in post testing. We bring the equipment over to the equipment, uh, the test equipment over to the filter bank or capacitor bank, and we perform the test right here. So everything is taped off for safety reasons. Okay, so, so during the presentation, I will uh, I will be showing uh, that this is the this is the uh, high voltage source here. Uh, so this is the transformer and the high voltage source. These are both calibrated instruments. Um, so this is uh, generating a low voltage signal to the transformer here, which boosts the voltage up. <laughs> the test voltage today is 40 kV. 40, 40 kV. Which is 50% of the withstand rating of this device. And I want to add Paul that this is an AC high pot test, not a DC high pot test. Right. Good point, AC high pot test. And um, this is a filter on top here. So we're, we're taking the uh, signal, we're bringing it into the equipment. Uh, this is the, uh, the uh, coupling capacitor, the coupling capacitor, and on the bottom here uh, is the, is the uh, and I want to make sure I'm calling it the same thing, is the uh, coupling device, the coupling device which actually connects it to the measurement instrument over here. Uh, so, uh, did I miss anything, Pete? No, that's it. Calibrator yeah. device? So the output, uh, so the AC, High voltage comes in, passes through the filter, filters out the noise that, that may be generated on this device. And on the output of the filter, it then feeds clean, a clean filtered 60 hertz wave, high voltage wave into the, uh, onto the A-page bus. So I might add that when we're doing the test here, the, uh, the, the test equipment is highly susceptible to noise within the plant, electrical noise within the plant. We actually have to tell people to, uh, to stop their work for a few minutes while we conduct this test. So um, we, will, we actually will see drills and saws going in our test instrument when we're running it. Uh, so everything is basically shut down here. So we'll start the test procedure. Uh, Pete and uh, Jessica will, will do that test. All right, so this is just a uh, calibration device for machine for the uh, Partial discharge test, we said 100 picofoulombs. So we're going to calibrate this instrumentation with this device to 100 picofoulombs. We're going to do that attach one side to ground, attach the other side to the output. We're putting 100 picofoulombs of noise basically onto the A phase bus. And then uh, we found that we actually need to step away from it a little bit so we don't generate noise. And now you come over to here, Jessica, and Jessica can uh, explain a little bit what she is doing. So the calibration test instrument is cooked up. It's putting in a series of, of waveforms that is exactly equal to 100 picocoulombs. You can kind of see this in the in the uh, in the waveform. So the measurement instrument is picking up that picocoulombs, and uh, Jessica would then yeah, so calibrate I, the instrument. I set the 100 picocoulombs here because that's what. The calibration device is set to, and I just uh, hit calibrate. And if you look here, um, it'll be about 100 picocoulombs because that's what we just calibrated it to. And then we also have to do the voltage as well, so that's next. And Peter will use the high voltage test set to calibrate it, and we'll, we calibrate it at 10 kV, just a lower level to. So basically, this is a Hayfley uh, PD test set. It's a DDX uh, 91 
uh, 9121B partial discharge uh, detector. We have the 9230 series capacitive voltage divider and the calibrator that he was using there is a KAL9511 calibrator. Uh, so, um, so now they're going to bring the voltage up to 10 kV and basically that is to get the correct voltage ratio in the test instrument here. So when we're conducting the test, the, the device knows what voltage we're at. All right, so I'm gonna put power on, main power on for the iPod tester. And power up. And I'm raise the voltage to 10 kV. At the same time, Jeff is gonna basically, uh, I'm gonna tell her when I'm at 10 kV. So you can see what's going on here, where we have the voltage coming up. You can actually see the people plumes coming up also. So it's just calibration still that we're doing here. So we're looking to get 10 kV at the test instrument here. And that's why it's important that the high voltage device, the, the high voltage source actually be a calibrated instrument. Uh, All right, Jess, I am at uh, 10 kV. All right, so it's calibrating and you'll see this kind of reset itself. And you are at 10 kV heat, so you can take it down and then we'll start the test. All right, you ready? Yep. All right. So, so the... The objective here is you're going to bring it to 40 kV, which is 50% of the test value, 50% of the withstand rating of the equipment. At that point, the, there is an assumption that we're going to go into, into uh, a partial discharge. Yes. And it's going to be a significant partial discharge. So I'll, I'll, bring up, I'll bring the voltage up slowly so maybe you can see uh, the, 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 partial discharge. the partial discharge increase over, over the increase of voltage. Why don't you get Matt? Why don't you come over here and uh, get close up to the screen here so the viewers can watch what's going on? So we're sitting at zero kV right now. Pete's going to start raising the voltage, you and you can see as we raise the voltage, the partial discharge will start to uh, pick up. And this is pico coulombs. So we're about seven kV, and the pico coulombs is rising up through eighty kV, eighty pico coulombs here. Uh, so as we continue to rise, you can see. Um, that the pico coulombs continues to rise. Yeah, 17 kV. Yeah, 20 so kV. The uh, plot to the right is is uh, pico coulombs in voltage versus time. So it's recording kV. the entire test that is going on here. Uh, 35 kV, and we just hit above uh, the 100 pico coulomb value, Paul. All right. So um, you're at 38 kV. You can kind of see where we're bouncing very high up in pico coulombs now, indicating that uh, we are into a, a, a partial discharge area. 39.8, 40. All right, so we're at 40 kV, and this would be an uh, indication that we are beyond the uh, corona inception voltage, okay, which is something lower than where we are here. Okay. So we will hold it here. How long will you hold it here for? Or is uh, it, is it ready? Mean, what, if we go into inception, we can uh, come out any time. Uh, sometimes uh, it may take a little bit to get into it, uh, but we can find that normally when we get to that half, uh, we'll, we pretty much go into it right around. Okay. So now Pete's going to start dropping the voltage, and um, the standard that we're following here dictates that we must, at 26.5 kV, we must be at or below 100 pico coulombs, and that would be considered a test that has passed. After two minutes. We have up right. to two minutes. All right. So we bring it down to 26.5 kV. We have, within two minutes, we have uh, to see if the, the, the discharge rate is less than 100 pico coulombs. So she's bringing, I'm bringing the voltage down here. And we've already technically passed, and we haven't even gotten. You're at 30. So 26.5. 27, stop. Right. You're at 26, you can bump it up just a little if you want it. So, so people make sure right. he'll look to get at 26.5 kV. We're at 27.13 kV here. And you can see that the pico coulombs is below 100. The test standards dictate that you be below 100 uh, at what is called the extinction voltage. Okay, so this here, uh, we, we are below that extinction voltage, the 27.11 kV. Uh, is was required by the standard, and again we're below 100. So this would be considered a pass uh, on this test here. Uh, so normally what would be done is you would turn the equipment off, ground it, and uh, why don't you do that real quick and we'll just talk about a couple things you might have found uh, in the process of doing this uh, over the last year or so. And so 
I know for this piece of equipment, I was told just the other day that they did find that they did find one issue, and that was a ungrounded breaker. And one of the things with partial partial discharge is that if you have a piece of metal up by the bus bar somewhere or anywhere in it within the equipment, an ungrounded an ungrounded metal parts near high voltage parts will definitely result in a failed uh, partial discharge test. What, what other things yeah, so, have you found? So we found the, rea the reactor. You can show the reactor strap. Uh, okay. For this, the core was not the the core was not ground to the lower piece, and it was just so the lower piece was just floating uh, in air, and uh, that floating metal caused us to to have the discharge value that was uh, greater that made it fail. So, so this to kind of talk about what this is. This is an iron core reactor. Uh, it's floating up on insulators. It rises up in potential. So what we're doing the test is actually coming up to 40 kV. Uh, and this metal part here, if it, if it were left ungrounded, it would be floating. And you would definitely get partial discharge in that region. There would be a significant amount of voltage stress there. Uh, so, so I found that missing strap. Uh, we had found that the breaker wasn't grounded properly. The other things that we typically find is if the through wall Pushing area is not done correctly. Uh, it will it will fail because of that. If we have a bushing, a, a bushing, a real bushing that has both a high voltage and a ground shield in it, uh, we might find that one of those bushings could fail also because of a defect from the component supplier. The component came to us and say it has air bubbles inside. It could potentially fail at that point too. Uh, anything else, Pete? Well, the only other thing I want to add was this this uh, system is. Built to 200 kV, but uh, for nameplate at 170 kV DIL. So we actually have a little more we have some margin in our design. Okay. So that helps us, it makes it look easy us passing a test. But maybe if we designed 170 and, and built for 170, it might have been a more difficult test. Good point. So it's true for impulse testing too. If we design for 200 and we impulse at 170, easier to pass. Uh, there was one other uh, thing I remember uh, on one of the previous projects is we, the, uh, the breakers come with a lifting bracket Correct. and we had two identical pieces of equipment. One, um, the brackets were removed because the, the assembler remembered to do so and we passed part of discharge right away. There was another one where uh, one of the brackets was left on by the state and that bracket was causing uh, basically a clearance issue, but not a significant clearance issue. And what we noticed is that the partial discharge test between one uh, system, which was identical to another, was completely different. It passed so, impulse with yes. the bracket in, Correct. but it didn't yeah. pass partial discharge. Yeah, so that, that test, uh, we had impulse first, we passed the impulse, and then when we did partial discharge test, it was the only, uh, we were failing for partial discharge. We did not fail for high pot, did not fail for impulse. Mm -hmm. Partial discharge was just uh, we were on the edge for some reason failing. Went searching around the equipment, and we found the lifting bracket that was used that's used to lift the breaker and put it into place had been left on. So it's very interesting. I mean, what we're identifying throughout these tests is that one test may pick up one error, but not another type of error. So we had a clearance issue. The uh, impulse testing, according to what Jessica is saying here, um, did not pick up on that bracket being present. We did the partial discharge, and it was in the signature of that partial discharge test result that we could see that something was different, something was wrong. Uh, so we went hunting through the equipment to locate that that uh, problem, and uh, locate it, found it, and removed it. So partial discharge testing, impulse testing are two very important tests uh, to pick up that equipment, to pick up on defects in the design, uh, and also defects in the component variables.
throw on the discharge occurring and the insulation is pounding it multiple times a cycle uh, on a continuous basis, it eats away at the insulation and over time it fails. And the worst thing I have to, uh, to think about is the failure occurs when somebody's doing a switching operation. It just so happens that it's usually a switching operation, a transient that will bring a defect uh, a system that has been degraded over time because of partial discharge, tracking or treating, uh, something like that, that uh, the, the condition will most likely result in flashover when the guy is switching. So it's really an arc flash hazard that you want to avoid and uh, want to prevent partial discharge. So I'm going to go back to my office. Thanks, right. Pete. Thanks, right. Jessica. Thank you. And uh, Matt, maybe you can show off the equipment for a second while I'm heading back. Okay, back with you. So <clears throat> we'll go back to the presentation. I think we got just a couple slides. I'm gonna put my pointer on the way out. Okay. Um, okay. Test reports. Um, just like partial, uh, just like the SFRA and um, and the impulse test, we got to generate a report after, and it's what we hand our customers. So we have a partial discharge test report. Incidentally, that instrument, that Hayfleet Trench instrument, uh, does a lot of the um, a lot of the analysis uh, to determine that partial discharge level. Uh, so there's a lot of detail in that uh, in that instrument. But this instrument creates the test report. We put the conditions in there, the equipment, um, the environmental conditions, and uh, come up with the voltage levels, the test standards, and then we, we create a test report that we hand to our customers. And there's three, phase A, phase B, phase C, uh, that we're doing. So we're doing three tests per piece of equipment. And we got a piece of, we got a question here. Yeah, another question from Garrett. Uh, he noticed that we tested at 50% of the BIL rating, and he's asking if the equipment is going to be protected by surge arresters at that voltage rating. So we, we um, the, 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 uh, the extinction and the, the, the extinction level is dictated by the standard, uh, and that is based upon the impulse level. Um, the arrestor rating is based upon uh, the impulse rating of the equipment, well, let me see, it's based upon the voltage rating of the equipment and the grounding of the system for which it's connected to. Uh, so uh, we're not sizing the arrestor based upon, based upon this test, but rather based upon um, the voltage rating of the equipment and the grounding of the system. What uh, type of grounding do we have in the system? Remember, if you have a... Um, three-phase system, and it's a resistive grounded system. When you have a line-to-ground fault, you get a voltage shift uh, in your phase to neutral voltage or your phase to ground voltage. And because of that, the arrestor rating has to be increased to something closer to the line-to-line -line value. But if we have a solidly grounded system, the arrestor rating can be dropped. It can be dropped to a lower value because when you have a line-to-ground fault, you don't get that neutral voltage or that phase to ground voltage shift. Let me make sure I get that right. Phase of ground voltage shift because of solid ground system. So you don't get no shift. And therefore, we can rate the arrestor to a lower value. It's really about the MCOV rating of the arrestor. What's the maximum continuous over voltage rating of the arrestor? We want to make sure that the maximum continuous over voltage rating of the arrestor exceeds the normal line to ground voltage rating uh, plus any over voltage conditions we might have. Plus, we need to account for, well, what can happen during a fault? What can happen during a fault? What kind of over-voltage condition will we apply to the arrestor? Uh, so this is the, the way we rate the arrestor, really somewhat uh, unrelated to the partial discharge test. So partial discharge test is really about making sure that we're partial discharge free at the operating voltage, and that uh, if there is an over-voltage that brings us into, into partial discharge region, that uh, when the voltage returns back to normal, that the partial discharge will stop or cease to exist. And that's at that extinction voltage. So I think that I hope that answers your question.
So we have a test, uh, 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 and thank you for the question, Garrett. We have a test uh, report that we issue, and the customer gets that. Uh, so I have cited some standards in this, um, in this presentation. I also note that there's two, some YouTube videos. Um, I, I looked at both of these YouTube videos. They're really uh, good videos. Uh, these, I'm not sure if it's the same individual. I think they're different individuals, but they do a great job presenting uh, partial discharge. And there is a lot of other material on YouTube. This is a very complex subject matter, and I really touched upon it in the most basic form. Uh, but from our perspective, uh, we understand the standards. We understand the test equipment that we need to use. And uh, we're, we are making sure uh, that uh, our equipment is partial discharge free, which means you're going to get 20 year life out of the equipment. And that's really our desire is to design equipment that will last 20 years. Um, so we have done three different main tests in the last few weeks. Uh, power frequency withstand test we didn't do, but basically that's bringing the system voltage up to a withstand value based upon the standard that you're designing for it, whether it's IEC, CSA, or IEEE. Lightning impulse test, we say, is very important because it helps to confirm the impulse rating of your equipment. Partial discharge testing we did today, um, again, is designed, it's, it's really to confirm that your equipment will last for 20 years, and that's really what that test is all about. And uh, SFRA testing is about that getting and making sure that your filter is actually has the impedance profile that you asked for. And that's the three tests that we really think that should be specified on metal closed cap banks and filter banks. So uh, if you're specifying these, this type of equipment, uh, these are the lines to add to your specification. So you're creating a specification, uh, come to our tech talk and you can specify those. Our guide form specifications located on our website also contain all these test requirements and some other additional tests that we recommend to make sure that you're getting what you asked for. So in, in conclusion, remember, medium voltage metal closed cap banks and filter banks are custom. Uh, if you want a 20 year life, specify uh, partial discharge testing. You gotta specify the test if you wanna make sure you're buying equipment that's of high quality and that will last 20 years. Today, to get the PDHs, those PDH contact hours, uh, just put in 222, send us an email, either myself or Matt, and we will get you a certificate. And uh, we appreciate uh, your attendance again. If you got uh, any topics you want to cover, uh, anything involving uh, metal closed capacitor bank or filter bank design, reactive compensation, please come to us. We would like to, uh, to further elaborate on subject matters that you might have. Another question. Yeah, Paul, we do have a couple more, but since we're at the end anyway, I'll, I'll throw up the question screen just to give everybody 30 seconds to get their last couple questions in, and then we can just answer them in bulk. Uh, right, so so we'll be right back. If you've got any questions, uh, feel free to put them in now. All right, great. with you and I've read through the questions so I'm going to read them out loud Keith uh, McCarthy hello Keith um, say so you say do, is there a way to locate the partial discharge how do you locate where the partial discharge is in the equipment and that is uh, it's very difficult when we do have partial discharge it is kind of a go and hunt uh, situation um, they do have a device which we do not have which is like an antenna device that you can point into your equipment and uh, listen for it um, there is also turn out the lights and look for a corona. 
Uh, that is another one. And then you get the audible sound thing to, to look for. Um, for us, uh, we generally will start to hunt and peck and search through the equipment and try to find uh, where that partial discharge is occurring. Sometimes we're disconnecting uh, one stage at a time. This last uh, project, uh, when they had the breaker that was left ungrounded, they ended up uh, opening up the disconnects and they located which stage it was on. And then at that point, they identified the breaker. So we might start disconnecting, trying to isolate at that point. Uh, but it can be very difficult uh, to find that uh, region where you might be having partial discharge. Uh, so that's a good question. Uh, at some point in time, we may decide to pur purchase this other type of equipment uh, to, to help us locate problems when we do have them, because it can be quite time consuming. Um, <clears throat> there is a question with the installation strength of the air being at 21 kV per centimeter. Is there any value in testing for corona on equipment that will operate below this voltage? And I think the uh, I think that the real question here is um, is do we get to the voltage stress level where we can have partial discharge in the equipment? And uh, the answer to that question is yes. I mean we have already identified multiple uh, problems in our equipment uh, at the 38 kV and below level for which the voltage stress can exceed that of air and can cause problems in the equipment. Uh, so if you take a piece of jumper cable and you lay it at ground potential, uh, you will have partial discharge uh, in that uh, cable or along the edge of that cable, and this device would pick it up. Same with the pass-through. If it's not done correctly, you will detect it, as well as voids within uh, bushings. So we have been able to identify issues with the equipment uh, at this 38 kV voltage level and below uh, on many occasions. And uh, we have also witnessed... Um, our equipment in the field, uh, equipment that might be 10, 15, uh, 20 years old, where there has been partial discharge activity, um, tracking along insulators and so forth. Uh, so there is a lot to be learned from, from doing this test. Uh, another question is, uh, or is the person part? Okay, I think I answered the question. So I think that's, uh, that's everything. So next week, uh, we're going to do a presentation on renewables. How does um, NEPSI uh, equipment, how is it most suitable for the renewables industry? So if you're in a renewables uh, industry, we're going to be talking about metal closed cap banks, harmonic filter banks, and how our products are uh, well suited for the renewables industry, how uh, it benefits uh, the renewables, the developers, the EPCs that install those um, systems, how it uh, benefits them to use a metal closed system rather than an open air system and that's really the topic of next week's presentation. So uh, tell everybody around you, tell your colleagues, it's a great way to receive PDH contact hours and uh, again hit that like button below it kind of helps us out. Uh, when I post on LinkedIn if you could give me a thumbs up that would help give the word out also. So thank you for coming.